Welcome to Conversations Matter. I'm Hans Hickler. And I'm Molly Burkholm. Molly and I are big fans of having real, deep conversations. So sit back, relax, be present, and really enjoy this one. Today's interview is a really special one for me, and I know Hans as well. It is with Ruchira Gupta, who is an Indian sex trafficking abolitionist. She's a journalist. She's an activist. She has worked for over 25 years to end sex trafficking. She's been honored for her work everywhere from the United Nations to The Hague to any other organization you can imagine. Um, in 2002, she established an organization called APNIAP Women Worldwide, which is a non-governmental organization that addresses women's rights and the eradic- eradication of human sex trafficking. Ruchira has personally transformed the lives of over 15,000 women who were trapped in human trafficking and at risk of prostitution in India. She is a change maker down to the smallest cell in her body. What a, what a great, peaceful soul she is when you meet her and she has fought the toughest battle dealing with one of the most difficult and abhorrent practices that exist. You know, it's it's almost, it's like, you know, I think you told me there's more slavery now than there than there was during, during the time of, of slavery in our country. And for, I, I'm just amazed how this one individual, if you ever want to believe that one person can make a difference, listen to this conversation. This feels like a very special experience to be here together today. Thank you so much for joining us, Ruchira. Molly's been on pins and needles about this. (laughs) I'm so happy to be with Molly because I've talked to her and her passion for sex trafficking is something I share so deeply that it's going to be fun to talk to you. And Hans, you know, I've just heard about how you love conversations with ordinary people and how they matter. And that's exactly how my own journey began. Amazing. Great. Would you share more about that? How did your journey begin? How did you start on this path? You know, I did care for people's stories growing up, and I wanted to use those stories as a force for change and transformation. So I thought, okay, I'll be a journalist, and uh, once I tell people what's going on in the world, then things will change automatically. Some sheepish, some did not answer. But the few who did said, uh, don't you know they all are in Bombay? Now, Bombay was 1,400 kilometers away, and these villages were so remote that they were even two hours away from the highway. So I was puzzled, and I began to explore what was really going on. And the answer changed my life, because I found that there was a smooth supply chain from the villages of Nepal to the brothels of Bombay. There was the local village procurer who could be an uncle, a neighbor, who would offer a poor, starving farmer $50, $100 for a little girl between the ages of 9 and 13 and say, I will get her a job in the big city or get her married or even say that he would put her into prostitution and say, but she'll have food, she'll have a roof, she'll send some money back home. And the farmers were so isolated and so ignorant, they didn't know what all this meant and they let their daughters go. This man would cluster together three or four girls And uh, they would be, you know, taken to the border of India and Nepal. On the border were the Karab border guards, wink, wink, nod, nod. The girls were taken across the border. It was a whole supply chain network, huh? A whole supply chain. And as a business, a former businessman, um, Hans, you will know that. that I'm in the logistics business. It's it's incredible. And I think our, our listeners, I'm sure they're aware of trafficking, but they don't understand the magnitude and scale and the, the, the business the exploitation that, that sits behind that. The, the fact that this is a network. You know, I read a book um, that I love, Shantaram. And there's a chapter in Shantaram where he talks about the, the, these girls that are, that are brought to, to Mumbai for prostitution. But he's apologetic about it. He says, you know, I, I thought it was really bad, but then I realized, you know, the families couldn't couldn't support the last two children, so this is a better life for them. And I... 
I was revolted by that. That's the thing, you know. I wanted to ask all these people who think that life in a brothel is better than life on a sidewalk. How yeah. do they know? Right. Have they been inside a brothel? Have they been raped uh, by eight or ten men every night? Do they understand what body invasion means? Uh, because this is literally body invasion. What I saw in the brothels of Bombay were little girls who were locked up in small rooms by, uh, you know, with four beds stuffed into a room, a barred window, a, bin a window with iron bars. And uh, no room for escape. Uh, pimps standing at the door taking money for each customer who was walking in. And literally just having to be available for 8, 10, 15 customers. And the customer could be fat, he could be unwashed, uh, he could be smelly, he could be disease-ridden, he could be older. Uh, his socks could be smelling because some of the women keep to talking to me about the feet of the customer smelling, uh, someone with a pus leaking. And they could say nothing, you know, everyone had to be allowed access to their body. So I began to use the term body invasion because of that. And most people who think that life in a brothel is better than life on a sidewalk don't know this. But what, what gets in, in the beginning of the supply chain? What gets into the mind of a father and mother that, that can believe that? They are, first of all, so ignorant that to them, Bombay means big city, mega lifestyle, nothing can go wrong there because the little that they know comes from ads, uh, you know, in magazines or on bus stops or uh, products or sometimes little snatch TV serials. So they don't see anything ugly. They don't see the ugly side of Bombay. And to them, you know, Sex doesn't seem, they cannot imagine the exploitation that occurs. And, mm -hmm. you know, they feel the worst situation for anyone is starvation and um, not having a, a room. Which is a horrible thing, of course. I mean, there's desperation that starts at the beginning. You, know, you mentioned in an interview I, I saw that, uh, you know, at the root of trafficking is inequality. And I, I think when we look at this supply chain of trafficking at the very beginning, is the poverty and inequality of these these families, right? Yes, absolutely. So I would say that prostitution is based on uh, sexism and poverty, the combination of the two. So one is that there are customers at the end of this whole supply chain who want very young girls. Sometimes they even ask for virgins, which is why traffickers go into these poor, isolated families to look for girls who are 9, 10, 11, 12. On the other hand, what do they take advantage of? The inequality, mm -hmm. and uh, which makes the girl vulnerable to being trafficked or to be preyed upon by the trafficker. And what is the vulnerability based on? It's based on the inequality of sex because a girl goes along with whatever her father decides, her boyfriend decides, her husband decides for her. The inequality of class, which I would say manifests in poverty. They're so poor that sometimes they get two meals a week, not two meals a day. And there is also the inequality of caste in India and Nepal, you know, where uh, there are a whole group of people who are from oppressed communities known as castes. Uh, and then, of course, there's age, the hierarchy of age. A young girl cannot take decisions for herself. She yeah. has to obey her family and her father particularly. So all these intersecting inequalities make her more vulnerable to a trafficker than any other girl. So I call her, in fact, uh, the last girl, the most vulnerable human being that I know. And this this is so important because it's not obviously it's horrible in India and Nepal, but it's happening in every city all over the world. Um, and it's interesting because when I started working with this, to be honest, I mean, my passion for this started back in 2005, but now still when I talk about it, there's so many people who don't realize that there are more slaves alive today than at the time we consider, you know, the end of slavery back in the mid 1800s, which, and it's in all of our towns, it's in all over the world. So I, I was wondering if you could share for everyone who might not know the breadth of it, could you explain a little bit about the full breadth of what is occurring and the full face of, of slavery? in this world. You know, so you're right that in the 19th century, uh, you know, the numbers of people who were trafficked for slavery to work on plantations um, in the transatlantic slave trade uh, was a few million in, you know, less than 10 million, right? And could vary from 3 million to 16 million maximum is what people say. And now on any given year, I can tell you that there are like 
27 million trapped in situations of different kinds of slavery today and more being trafficked every day so uh, you know people are being trafficked for prostitution and other forms of sexual exploitation like to make porn films etc but also uh, you know for the organ trade for child labor domestic servitude uh, sometimes to become child soldiers as in the case of isis and other places so uh, you know this kind of trafficking has begun to become much more organized and smooth in that sense it's similar to 19th century but the use of the people is for different reasons because there's a new demand new kinds of demand in our world today also what is happening is that you won't see people in chains anymore and in the 19th century slavery was out uh, was sanctioned by law in our century slavery is outlawed so nobody has a right to own another human being uh, so in that sense uh, you know things are much more subtle now you don't really own them but you control them in different ways right mm-hmm. so um, you will say that i uh, won't give you food or i will hold your family hostage or i will hold your child hostage uh, or you know sometimes very quickly on uh, you know the girls in prostitution are made dependent on drugs and alcohol to keep them from running away and so the pimp may be uh, just offering you a little bit of drugs or alcohol and saying i'll keep this away from you so there are different ways of control so you won't see people in chains but uh, for sure there is a lot of control and there is huge amounts of exploitation to the fa- point that um, you know people don't survive this beyond the ages of 35 or so uh, rates of mortality in uh, prostitution are higher than uh, in war ptsd among uh, women in prostitution is higher than returning war vets mm-hmm. so you can imagine the kind of exploitation to manifest in these kind of outcomes Absolutely. And as we see with Epstein and Weinstein and <laughs> and all of these situations, craft, we see how so much of the prostitution, too, could come off as the gray areas. Well, these 14, 16-year-old girls, they were choosing to do it because they wanted the trip. They wanted the fancy party. They wanted the new clothes. And it's like, no, these are children and they're being manipulated. and and victimized so there's there's so many different levels of it that uh, that and i feel we are losing the fight in the gray area of giving permission to those places sometimes could could you speak to that of how our perspective on what slavery is affects yeah that? you know i uh, feel that uh, with the uh, epstein and weinstein what also happened was that the exploitation of women was normalized and uh, so people thought this was the way it was both the people who were using the girls and the girls who were being used and those who were facilitating the whole process and uh, it was normalized because people would tell me even when i began working in the brothels of bombay the police officers would tell me why do you want to eradicate this prostitution is as old as the hills men will be men if prostitutes don't exist girls from good families will be raped and i said but why should that be why can't a girl just become a rocket scientist or a doctor? doctor why does she have to be just sexually available and her body so consumed that uh, you know she's finished by the time she's 30 or 35 because in prostitution you earn the most on your first day in the job and in most situations you're not even allowed to keep what you earn it's the pimp the brothel keeper you know the whole lot of people who uh, control the woman who keep the money or the girl you know the whole epstein weinstein case what it has revealed is how people can abuse power to exploit and they will do so and it's not okay and i think the me too movement had a big role in that by just blowing the lid off it where women began to talk about what do they feel is exploitative what is harassment to them because nobody even understood it till then the conversation hadn't happened globally in such a big way right from a place where culture flowed from hollywood right so it began to make us think differently but you know to answer your question molly about um you know is uh, why did why does it happen in terms of what what is this is it a choice like are these girls in 
for the ride. No, they're not. It's actually prostitution and sexual exploitation. And even, uh, you know, dead bondage or domestic bondage, any kind of thing is absence of choice. Mm -hmm. Because uh, people are choosing from very unequal circumstances to go back to what Hans spoke about initially, you know. And we don't want to recognize that. That, you know, the girl who's choosing to go and uh, do a massage to someone for $200 uh, because Epstein says that I will uh, give you $200 plus maybe get you a modeling assignment in Victoria's Secret. Um, she possibly has no other way to access all of that. So access itself is such a big thing that uh, people in power use, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I think we have to understand. So this is marked by absence of choices. The other girls who were being abused by Epstein, yes, they had education. They possibly were in good high schools, going to colleges. Many of them came from a foster care system, special education facilities. So what we have to understand is the system is broken. And why is the world so unequal that for young girls to have access, they have to choose this pathway? That is more important. That's the issue, the, the, the power dynamic is by definition that one has less choice in life than the other. This powerful person can give me access rightfully or, or wrongfully, right? So you say, oh, well, they made a, a choice to give him a massage, but it's not that, that choice. The, the choice is that the power dynamic sits. I just listened to this amazing podcast called Slow Burn on the Monica Lewinsky and Bill Clinton thing. And they're like, well, she was 21 years old. She knew what she was doing. It was the president of the United States. This is like, this is a, a young girl. Like the power dynamic was, was so off. Exactly, know? Hans. And that's what I always think that, you know, if everybody who has power is more conscious of it when they exercise it, I think we can equalize the world much more. But those who have power in the moment don't realize it. Because how did Epstein just justify what he was doing? He probably said, oh, I gave her $200. It's a good amount of money for an hour. But he hired women to find vulnerable girls leaving these schools. The, exactly. These girls, these women were, were looking for a certain type of girl mm -hmm. that, that displayed vulnerability because they knew that that girl would follow them to this guy's house. That girl would be impressed or, or, or needy for attention. So it's prey. It's prey. It's absolutely preying on a vulnerability and I think the powerful should take a second to think about the fact that would this girl have sex with them if they did not pay for it? Of course not. And if that question is asked, you know, because there's the whole myth of the happy hooker and I think that they should think about why she's smiling. She's smiling because people buy her happiness, people buy her body and they want to think they are buying someone who's happy with it. They're kidding themselves. Because what they have to think about is that would she still allow access to her body if she was not paid for it? You talked about this this young lady in Indonesia who was looking for a life in the U.S. and so that that's the other the other side of this. Maybe you can talk a little bit about that. It it, it sometimes the supply chain is not as tight, but but it is right. So so this this, this exploitation has so many angles. It's young girls it can be not young girls it can be disguised yeah, this woman from uh, indonesia chandra Vuruntu, uh, was basically uh, educated from indonesia had been a cultural ambassador for her country to japan so you know she was uh, she had she was not isolated she was not ignorant she had a certain self confidence and she was running away from a situation at home where her husband was kind of, she wanted to get away from her husband. And uh, she paid a smuggler, uh, you know, of human beings to come inside the country of United States. And instead of smuggling her and taking a little bit of money, he just put her into a brothel. And by the time she's inside the brothel, there were, you know, locks and chains and baseball bats, etc. And, uh, you know, once she submitted to the fear, they kept on using the fear to keep her and then it was too late uh, for her to overcome the fear and get out for many, many years. She has now and she's now running a shelter for survivors called Mentari in Queens, uh, you know, supporting other young girls uh, from Asia who are trafficked here. But, you know, the whole journey itself uh, that, you know, you pay someone to smuggle you and then you end up in a situation of being trafficked 
is uh, very very common and of course you know the other situation that can be uh, which makes migrants uh, vulnerable to traffickers is they may not have documents they may not have family networks they may not know the language of the country they are in they may have no jobs they may have financial needs sometimes they also fear law enforcement they may not be legal and uh, you know in in uh, the current scenario you know about the fact that there are children in detention camps uh, along the mexico us border how do we know what's happening to those kids eventually how many of them are getting lost because the system is so broken who's watching out for them and if they are lost if they disappear from these camps where will they end up you know in this great country like we we literally do not know i have worked in the un outside refugee camps in kosovo and other places and i have seen how traffickers will move into conflict areas and they know that the people are homeless they know there is no law and order they know there's no food uh, there's a lot of army bases around the women are being sexually exploited anyway and that's where they also prey upon girls so vulnerability can take many different forms uh, i i can relate to just how that cascades into helpless bondage right when i was living in in singapore you know we we there's many what they call the amas the, the young ladies from the philippines that that you know clean the house they live in the house in hong kong and singapore and the first time i moved to asia everybody said okay when when you hire her you take her passport so that she can't leave and we said well, we're not taking her passport and they go well then they'll go off to malaysia and they'll create problems in malaysia and you're responsible for them and so people people like american and and european smart business people took the passports i mean method the, the, of control this is a method of control it's a control so you can imagine that this young lady from indonesia coming here the first thing they do is take her passport and say you can't leave o- exactly. already it starts and you know this reminds me of a woman i once met who was trafficked from um, philippines uh, she was in the uae and her passport was taken away her employer of course was making her work all hours giving her food last etc she was in domestic servitude but then he also tried to sexually exploit her so she killed him with scissors with kitchen scissors and of course she was the one in prison and in philippines all the maids uh, who had been through similar situations organized they fought for her and she came back to philippines and now she is a pop singer Really? Yes. That's She's amazing. She's in clubs and all of that. So there's also some uh, stories about that. Uh, and, you know, my own journey has been such a long one. Uh, I began in these villages in Nepal nearly 25 years ago. And at that time, you know, there were no laws. No, there was no understanding that there is trafficking behind these situations of exploitation. First of all, you know, domestic servitude, uh, prostitution, um, child labor was not even seen as exploitation. You know, it mm. was that, oh, we are giving these people a job. They don't have money. You know, we are obliging them. It's a win-win situation, right? And then slowly when we began to explain the harm in the situation and that the choice was, as you said, among many unequal choices so limited choice uh, you know uh, we were able to do that and uh, you know one of the things i did hans was that i made a documentary when i saw this issue in nepal up to the brothels of bombay little girls being raped and you know whole supply chain as you said from this procurer to the border guard to the pimp to the transporter to the brothel manager the money lender the organized criminal networks and finally the customer driving the whole demand side and so i said i've got to tell the story to the world because it's my lifetime my generation my country my world and it's like 19th century but not quite it was more subtle so i um, made a film called the selling of innocence won an emmy for it and uh, i was here in new york in the broadway marquis hotel hotel all glitter and people offering me all kinds of jobs and i said this is limiting i don't want to do this i want to take on this new form of exploitation which is so organized and uh, i said i have to disrupt this somehow my idea was disruption as a journalist and so i quit journalism and went back to bombay uh, with my award and the dvd of the film in those days there were dvds and i showed it to the women and i said what do you want and interestingly enough you know uh, the women in the film were mothers as and they wanted to save their daughters from the same fate as themselves 
सो दे हैड ब्रोकन दर साइलेंस एंड ओवरकम दर शेम एंड दर स्टिगमा बाय एक्चुअली स्पीकिंग आप यू नो फॉर द फर्स्ट टाइम एवर इन द लाइव इन माई डॉक्यूमेंट्री जस्ट टू सेव दर डॉटर्स देर थ्री थिंग्स दे वॉन्ट इफ आई रिमेंबर दे वॉन्ट इट अ रूम where they could literally for was it for they wanted a room where they could sleep as long as they want and feel like nobody could come into that room at any given time it was so eye opening because you talk about emboldenment and self empowerment i was telling molly what it's so inspirational what you did after that emmy because this is about these teaching these women how to how to survive and stand on their own feet and and start anew Yes, and absolutely. And this idea of empowerment in in changing the world, you know, you you say so you can give somebody a fish and 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 you know or you can teach them how to fish, right? Your 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 organization is teaching them how to stand on their feet, to be emboldened, self-empowered. These are your words that I'm repeating back to you, but that is as inspirational to me as the awareness side. I have a question for you Hans you know and then I'll answer the idea about empowerment and all of that in a second but you know are these the same principles you use to run a successful business I think so uh you know I always say if I knew now what I knew then I would have been a different different leader but I think the way I answer that is I don't think you can go to work with a different value system that you have when you're at home or in your community and most people do It's like, you know, I tell tell my my clients, you don't leave work with one arm left at home. How do you go into the boardroom and not represent all of your values? Everything that makes you who you are. Um but in order to be successful in this world where you're trying to do quarterly results, people sacrifice that. Um and so I think good leaders empower their teams. embolden their teams you know my definition of of success was when i left for another job that my team went on no matter who they you know i i left i left the team in a more powerful and in a more capable way than than when i came in and that means i have to give them the tools to be empowered and the and the framework to be empowered uh and that and part of that framework is be who you are figure out who you are and bring all of that to the table no matter how difficult that is uh and 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 i learned that fairly late and i think it it again has to do with how comfortable do i feel with taking risk what 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 do i have behind me that whether that's family community money that allows me yeah. to feel a little bit more secure to take that risk absolutely yeah i admire people that are 21 years old that are taking those risks that is pure value action True. when you're 40 or 50 I have more license to exercise my values because I have the, the the everything that stands behind me. And I think so so I but I I think that I think everything we do is rooted in trying to understand what is the right thing to do. Who am I in 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 this play? What role do I have and what role can I have yeah. to make whatever I'm doing better? You know it's funny because that's what happened to me. I was filming um The Selling of Innocence is the name of the documentary and I was filming it inside the brothels and a man pulled out a knife at me and he said I won't let you film here. And literally I had no way of running away. The brothels have narrow staircase, one staircase, 20 rooms after that up on the first floor and uh, little rooms, you know, with four beds. If I couldn't get out, there was no exit. And um the 22 women who told their stories in my documentary literally surrounded me and told the man that if you have to kill her kill us first because we have decided to tell our stories for the sake of our daughters wow and the man thought that it would be too much trouble to kill 23 women and he ran away and so the first rescue was done by the women of me and i in that moment realized the power of collective self action which is what we began to call apne aap and we finally decided to create the ngo apne aap which means collective self action and our formula stayed the same you know we just decided to organize and organize and fight for basic dignity and basic rights um which are fundamental to the universal declaration of human rights which these women and girls were so deprived of You know, it's in um the trauma work th- that we do, a lot of times we talk about a trauma occurs in moments when you don't have a choice. 
And so when a little girl is sold by their own parents or victimized in whatever way, they don't have a choice in that moment. And so what I love about App Me Up, and even in part of your mission statement, it talks about it's you are giving these people a choice. And in that situation, these women who are slaves in a brothel, they created a choice, even though it, it might have seemed they were powerless. Um, and it, it's so beautiful because I know in, in my work with human trafficking survivors, I remember the first time I saw a little girl in a brothel. She was like maybe eight or nine years old and she was playing with dolls. And I just, I'm going to start crying even talking about it now. It was like, I've never seen anything like it. Like she'd already been raped probably hundreds, if not thousands of times. And she was playing with dolls. She was a child. And when I went up and started playing with her and talking to her and, and, um, and she, she just looked up and she said, I get to play now. And I'll never forget that. It was like, and that's the thing. Like she had the chance, the choice to play now that she, exactly. she didn't have before. And that's why, you know, uh, when people talk about like, oh, uh, this is a choice, I feel like taking them into the brothels to make them see it's not really. Mm -hmm. And what happens to a woman, uh, even an, a young woman who's 19 year old and not a seven year old child, what does happen to her when she is in this kind of a situation? You know, the trauma that you talked about, uh, you know, repeated body invasion has huge mental health consequences. And as I mentioned before, you know, even um, returning war vets don't suffer from the same amount of PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, as women in prostitution do. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, this I learned from the women, like, you you know, what are my learning tips to have created this organization, which has now helped, like, more than 20,000 women and girls put, like, traffickers in jail, including some kingpins, the first life imprisonment of a trafficker in India, help create the UN and the US government create laws and policies. How did this happen from that moment when, um, you know, I decided to make a film about it? And it's funny, you know, I, I think about it like how, you know, a, an odd series of coincidences uh, that I was the journalist who was in that village in Nepal. My nose twitched. I asked a question. The answer changed my life. But also, I was the journalist um, who listened to the women. You know, after the knife was pulled out, the, you know, when I went back with the Emmy and the DVD and asked them, what do you want to do? And they said, we want to educate our children. And let's start an organization. And I remember, I said, I don't know. I was daunted. I said, I don't know how to create an organization. I'm a journalist. I'm a storyteller. Mm. And uh, I've told your story. And I'll take it to the whole world. But I don't know what, to, what else to do. So they said, I didn't even know how to make a business plan. And, you know, they said that we have four dreams. Um, the first dream is, uh, you know, we want a job in an, uh, we want an education for our children, school. Uh, the second was they said they wanted a room of their own. And this was like listening to Virginia Woolf in a brothel <laughs> in India. And I said, what do you mean by a room of your own? And they said somewhere where we can sleep for as long as we want, because in brothels, customers can walk in night or day and where our children can play safely on the floor, because often the customers would reach out for the children. Mm. And uh, the third dream they had was they wanted a job in an office. And that was so weird because, you know, the brothels are like 20 rooms in a row, one toilet to 20 rooms, a narrow staircase growing up, rat infested, smelly, stinky, because only one window per room, four beds stuffed in, customers coming in and out all the time. The the bed stinking of sperm, dried sperm and sweat and all of that. And noise, very noisy because, you know, vendors and customers and music playing, people fighting with each other, all of that. Constant lights. I said, what does a job in an office mean to you? And they said, where we will get paid monthly, where we will not be verbally or physically abused, uh, where, um, you know, we'll have dignity. And I said, of course, you know, and the fourth thing they said was that they said they wanted, uh, they wanted justice. So I said, what does justice mean to and you? And a pension, right? Yes, also, uh, that yes, came old with age the pension. Job, right? that yeah, the pension. that went with the job, uh, a job in an office. That they could retire and they wouldn't have to worry about old age pension, like how to live then. They wouldn't have to die on the sidewalk, right? And the fourth thing they said was they wanted justice. And again, you know, justice seemed so far away in that brothel in India. 
you know, with people shouting, screaming, raping, all of that. So I said, what does justice mean to you? And they said, justice, uh, we want to punish those who bought us and sold us. They bro brokered away our dreams. And they said that there, there was nobody to watch out for us uh, when we were pulled out of school and put into a brothel. So they wanted justice as protection and as punishment for those, accountability. So that became our business plan, and that's how we started up. Yeah, but, uh, you know, I only learned how to Pretty much us. all basic rights, aren't they? These are the four fundamental rights, <laughs> right? Right, we, right we, to education. Our listeners listen right to that. There's to not one of those things that they don't have. Exactly. In abundance. Absolutely. And take it for granted. Yeah. You know, Molly, in another uh, podcast, asked the question, and we finally had to move away from it because there's no right answer, is what makes people want a 12-year-old child what 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 is that well you know i have talked to customers sometimes sitting on a bed while the bed next to me is shaking because another customer is with another woman divided by a sari but i have <laughs> asked customers in america in india in thailand cambodia because i went on to work for the un and help them create laws and policies on this subject and um you know, some say that, uh, the younger ones say that uh, they were forbidden to have sex with a girl or meet a girl. And they wanted to know how does one have sex. And then they became sex addicts coming here, uh, you know, where they could just have transactional sex. Some said porn, uh, you know, they had begun watching porn at an early age. And they wanted that kind of sex, which they could not have with their girlfriends or wives. Uh, so they wanted sex with violence and domination. A lot said that, actually. Um, you know, and some one man told me in Thailand, he says, you know, these girls are so loving. They even put toothpaste on my toothbrush, which my wife doesn't do back home. And he was an American. <laughs> Some want to buy children, you know. Uh, some had AIDS, so they said sex with a virgin would cure them of AIDS. Um, and, uh, you know, so some said we just like very young girls, you know. We don't want the old hags that we have at home. So different reasons, you know. And uh, But a lot, the underlying theme which came through about why do men buy sex was they wanted domination, they wanted sex with violence. The majority were like that. The younger students were not, but the older men were like that. It's interesting in that um, since starting to work with this, when I've spoken with people who've shared that they've hired prostitutes, oftentimes they'll say that their friends would talk about it and that that made it okay. Or they were on a business trip in Las Vegas and then they ended up going out with their colleagues or their friends or a bachelor party or whatever. And I think... Um, the role community plays in giving us permission to do these things is huge. That's true, you know, because what we do is we tend to either normalize it or legitimize it. And, uh, you know, a lot of men have told me, um, you know, especially in the financial world, because this is New York, that, uh, you know, this is the thing you do when you go out with customers at night. You'll take them to a strip bar or you'll take them to a nightclub and, you know, one thing leads to another, incentives and all of that. Girls are offered as incentives, right? Yep. So you can get a 10-year-old for lunch. And uh, that's how normalized it is that we've begun to I can think understand. Of I can wrap my head around all that. What I can't wrap my head around is that with a 12-year-old. Right, we we say that is an, an illness here. We say that there's it's a di it's a disease that somebody would want to have sex with a child. But when it's this rampant, it's not a disease. There's something. It's going, like an epidemic, right? It's an epidemic, but it it's you know I can wrap my arms around why men do what they do. Mm. I can't wrap my arms around anybody exploiting a 12 year old or a seven year old I, th th it seems there's too, there's also that thing everybody always wants the next step and with sex addiction th what you've had why do people turn to violence because what you had before isn't enough so now you want something else something more to, and in some way it's to make you forget about yourself to dissolve that sense of self or to feel power like you were saying or to feel yeah um, it's interesting that and in society we crave it shopping everyone wants this and then they want the name brand of that and then they want the other name brand of that mm -hmm. we all do it in our own ways i think excess too i Power. think you know i also yeah i think what molly is saying is so important that you know what society is giving not just permission to do this but society is almost driving you to do this 
that it's cool to do this you know it's uh, if you want to become a man you've got to do this you know this kind of culture where uh, they they will tell a young guy hey we have to go to a strip bar we have to watch this woman dance around a pole or whatever you know like a monkey literally and uh, so society is not just giving you permission but they're driving you towards this culture because you know here's this epstein uh, he seems like he grew up in a normal middle class american family the son of a park ranger what made him want this kind of world that he created for himself with little girls massaging him offering them to other people of course one was money and sheer greed that by offering girls as incentives he could possibly get more and more uh, networks and access and all of that but also some you know the world that he created inside his homes if you read the description of his homes you know even his soaps were say, shaped like vaginas or whatever like what what made him become who he was and i think uh, molly you're closer to it than uh, any of us are in the sense that where does this idea of permission come from and what is the root of this right that uh, the root of even giving the permission and driving men towards this because men are also imprisoned in this it's not uh, just that because once they get locked into it they are actually losing a sense of empathy and if they don't have empathy then the hormone which makes us feel good is oxytocin we don't release oxytocin so it's it's uh, it, it just takes away a feeling of feeling good from men too and that makes them tighter and more uh, rigid That's such right? a good point if people don't have empathy they're not producing oxytocin i'd never thought of that connection so they seek it outside themselves because they haven't found that deeper way to connect that's amazing are you a meditator i do but not as regularly as i would like to but i love meditating you know i'm indian so we grew up with mm-hmm. uh, y- yogic forms of meditation like pranayam So I do that a lot and you know but sometimes the work just takes over and you know I'm traveling a lot so uh but all this all this excess that we are faced with or that we create gets back to you know one of the reasons why Molly and I have this podcast is that people need to take time out and focus on themselves and community mm-hmm. and deep deep relationships deep conversations deep connection Like yeah. you know the what makes us do what we do a lot of it is the function of who we surround ourselves with right that's the discussion we we just had i'm very interested in this work that you do is it's it's got to be mentally draining it's got to be how, how do you decompress how what is your community that you surround yourself with that you know after 20 some years of this that you that you still have a smile on your face and and a sense of purpose and not defeated by by the magnitude of the problem what tell me about how you do that one is that i have had a lot of love in my life and so i've always had loving people around me so my parents were extremely loving um, you know my i may have differed with them on what do i want to do versus what do they want me to do but still a lot of love and family friends husband like just literally i've never faced any violence as such in my life from my circles except when i was inside the brothel when a knife was pulled out on me and when i was a journalist covering another story when people tried to kill me but i survived so i think uh, you know those two instances of facing violence as an adult and not as a child taught me how to stand up to violence and that itself gave me an education but because foundationally i had so much love I had the strength to take on the violence and take a stand against it. Um that itself is a privilege, you know, having unmitigated love in your life. I've re- I realize that now every day. Uh the other thing is that I love stories. So as a child, you know, I was always given books to read and I read so many stories from around the world, you know, and that opens up your mind. to know that uh, things can happen and things can be overcome it gives you larger ideas even if you're very young and very sheltered because i come from a family of privilege in india um you know i hadn't even seen the inside of a police station growing up let alone a brothel and uh, you know my father owned factories my grandfather owned factories i would go to school in a chauffeur driven car so it was just uh, not the world i was born in but it was definitely the world that i wanted to know more about which was beyond my boundaries and i think that curiosity came from reading you know just because i wanted to know the larger world and not stay stuck in my little bubble 
um and i think i also grew up in a family which was like a salon in a way because they all were activists inspired by gandhi and uh, you know nobody asked each other what do you do they would ask each other what do you do for others I love that. I know. So that was normal to me, you know. I would like everyone would be challenged on that. So I thought, okay, I'll. This is my way of doing for others is writing. <laughs> Then it became more and more and more, right? In the U.S., the first question is always, "What do you do for a living?" Even I grew up in Europe. They don't ask that. They say, you know, where are you from? At least, you know, as opposed to defining somebody about, you know, what their nine to five job is. I love what do you do for others. Yeah. So that was something which is normal. You know, my father still wears homespun. You know, uh-huh. yeah. Is he really? Yeah. He's a That's Staunch Gandhi, and then I'm very influenced by Gandhi too. So, for those don't know, who don't know about what homespun is, would you share that? It's a cloth uh, woven in the ha- home by ordinary people in small spinning wheels, and this was something that Gandhi started. That was the symbol of Gandhi was the spinning wheel. It was the spinning wheel, which was the symbol of Gandhi's freedom struggle against the British, to say that we will not buy. Uh, textiles made in manchester and which are sold to indians because uh, you know this just enslaves us we are buying your products the money is going back to england and we are getting nothing out of it we are just being taxed and taxed and taxed so gandhi said we will actually recapture our dignity by making our own products and uh, the spinning wheel became a symbol where in every home people began to spin their own yarn and their own cloth and when india became independent a whole bunch of these shops were opened called khadi uh, where um, this cloth was so- uh, sold so my father still to this day on october 2nd will go to such a shop and buy the homespun um, cloth and he still wears the white uh, kurta and dhoti just very much like gandhi the lo- it doesn't wear a loin cloth Incredible. it's a long dhoti so oh, i, I want to meet him grew up you would like him <laughs> suketu's so met him actually uh, uh. and uh, yeah so you know i grew up with those values that simple living high thinking wealth is a privilege uh, you've got to share uh, because that was a time of india's nation building mm-hmm. india had become independent there was a sense of freedom in the air so i began to value freedom like everybody could do anything we could be modern we could be equal we could experiment you know it was a very heady time when i was growing up and uh, It was kind of it's fun. In, it's interesting. Uh, I would say, of all the places I've visited, India and Brazil have this incredible dichotomy of wealth and poverty that stares you in the face. It's there, there are few places where most people like to ignore the things they don't want to see, mm. but in in India and and in Brazil, I find that's that's impossible. But the people of privilege deal with it in one of two ways: they shield themselves from it. and live their life of privilege or they try to understand how to bring social inclusion closer together and it sounds like you're clearly in 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 the latter but i i was always amazed by how people can live in the yeah. wealthy apartments of rio de janeiro and if they're spending their time involved with the injustice it's only to to protect themselves from not getting robbed from from being able to lie on the beach you know they have rules when you go to the beach gated only gated communities in india we have yes. these gated communities yes yeah. gated communities with with you know radios to bring the guard down to take you to your house and even to take the mud uh, made in a shuttle you know to the flat yes and and never go the same route and you know when your kids go to school it's all designed around the problem but not solving the problem you know that this concept of social inclusion and what we can do to make the world a better place with our behavior with the people we surround ourselves with the influence that we have you know this is again part of what this podcast is 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 maybe we can share with people a little bit what the real world is like you know what what can people do like what what are some I think you know people can do should not think about what they can do they should do what they can you know if you think you can't don't have time donate money if you have time donate money and time because sometimes uh, you know people at the bottom their resources are so limited that they won't even be able to absorb your time if they don't have an infrastructure to absorb the time but do all of it uh, if you can on, do volunteering online do online volunteering if you can't travel to a place but i would say it's important to do something and once that process begins with any individual they'll find more and more that they can do so i would say 
you know, just jump in and do what you can, uh, you know, from volunteering to donating money to using any skills you have uh, and sometimes a combination of all three. But I think that's the journey um, that will give back more than uh, what the giver gives to the person because it will teach them about empathy and that empathy will change the entire personality. Well, it's the, it's the, yes. as Vera says, it's the, it's the natural Zoloft of the world, empathy. <laughs> so true. Yes. It's what's going to change. And things. you know, empathy also, you know, you, you asked a very fundamental question that how do you know yourself? Yeah. And that's a question in one of India's uh, texts, uh, religious texts called Gita, which says, mm. know thyself, know thyself. But how do you know yourself? You know, when do you actually begin to, you know, you have to get away from the numbers and the Excel spreadsheets and all of that. It, it gets back to the beginning of the conversation about well, what can I do? What, what can our listeners do if they want to do something? First of all, understand, try to understand where we perpetuate inequality. Understand you, power. Understand power and, and understand that. And do I want to play in that? But in, in that piece of know thyself, what, what what would you say as the end of that? Like the so I found that knowing myself helped I learned about myself by knowing the other. So I had to get beyond, you know, I worked in the United Nations for 10 years and all of that. So I also had to deal with Excel spreadsheets and hierarchies and all of that. But the ultimate reality that I found was within myself by connecting to someone else. So I would put myself in the shoes of the other and by doing that, I had to know who I was because how, how can I put myself in someone else's shoes if I don't know who I am? Mm -hmm. And that really helped me know myself. A short shout out to our amazing sponsor, The Great Courses Plus. Uh, we're so grateful to have them uh, as our sponsor. The Great Courses Plus is an extensive library of content, lectures, courses on anything you can imagine academic content, hobbies, how to learn the guitar, you name it. Um, and it's completely curated and vetted, and you have all the experts uh, talking to you about these subjects. That's such an important point, Hans, because there's so much garbage out there right now of just people speaking about anything that um, that isn't really vetted in this way. This is such high-quality content taught by top professors at their universities or whatever it is that they're the expert in. They get the really top people yeah, the great, courses, the great Courses Plus is the premier online library of content and, and coursework, uh, and, and we're just so lucky to, to, to have them as a, as a sponsor. Um, you know, I'm, I'm uh, interested uh, in, in one on, on the sacred texts of the world. Uh, that, that's just going to be an amazing, amazing one. It's on my wait list. You want to take uh, that one together? I want to take that one. You got it. You got it. And you know what? Our listeners are going to get the deal of the century here because The Great Courses Plus has made an offer for 30 days completely free access uh, to the entire uh, library of contents of, 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 uh, of The Great Courses Plus. So the entire library is, is available for free to our listeners. All you have to do is sign up at thegreatcoursesplus.com slash molly. So write it out, thegreatcoursesplus, P-L-U-S dot com slash molly, M-O-L-L-Y, and you can uh, have access to this incredible library for 30 days free. And you can look at it on your iPhone, on your iPad. If you have a Roku TV, it's a streaming channel on Roku. It just doesn't get any easier to get a world of content right at your fingertips. That is so powerful. And that's where if people don't have never been with a human trafficking survivor, just to meet them, to talk to them, you know, so often people say when we were doing our yoga teacher training and meditation teacher training programs for the survivors, uh, they survived the sex trade sometimes as children. You think they're going to be able to teach meditation? And of course they do. They're human beings. And if you sit with them and talk to them and, and really get to know them, that light becomes apparent. Then we're not putting them in a category of damaged, broken goods that they never had any education or any chance. So what are you going to possibly do with them now? Like that's, you know, they'll be lucky to have, you know, just even a halfway decent life and to believe that it's possible. And that's what I love about your organization, Abniap, is that you create the bridge for them to have a second chance or maybe a third chance or a fourth chance or whatever chance we're on, but that they have, that you, you know, in some way it's that, you know, it's the namaste, it's seeing the light in them. And, and then even when they can't see it, 
Abniab and you are creating the bridge that they can walk across to get to that place where they do have that deeper layer of purpose and meaning in the world. And that that's everything. That's empowerment, the bridge. I think so. I think the bridge is a beautiful term, yeah, for all of us in any context, right? Mm -hmm. Because it really brings, because it's also the bridge to ourselves, right? Once mm -hmm. I learn the art of bridge building, then I can also make a bridge to myself, right? I can make a bridge to you, but I'll also know how to make a bridge to myself. Yeah, and there is no other. And that's what we see too. Then there's no other, there's exactly. No other. And that, then there's no yeah. other. And that's the capital H healing. Like we can heal, we can go to therapy forever. We can do all those things. The capital H healing comes when, you know, after we do a yoga nidra with the survivors and they sit up and they say things like, I felt the part of myself that they couldn't get to. I felt the part of myself they couldn't touch. When they sit up from that and they have this look that went from shame and guilt and fear and all of a sudden, they have this look of purity and love on their face. That's capital H healing, when they can feel that part of themselves that's untouched, that, that's in all of us. Yeah, it's that core, you know, exactly, Molly, uh, you know, that's such a beautiful way to say that, because even Hans was asking that what keeps me going, one is, of course, all this foundational stuff of love and uh, values and all of that, but the other is, you know, I think going back inside myself has helped me a lot because why am I doing it? Who am I? You know, these are questions I love grappling with, you know, which are going to be unanswered possibly all my life, right, mm -hmm. in a real way. But you always come closer to something, some layer, right? And I also love art. So I go to a lot of museums, galleries, art shows. My friends, are, many of my friends are artists. Top, some of them are India's top artists who support my work and talk to me and all of that. So the way of seeing, you know, John Berger uh, said that, you know, I wrote a book called The Way of Seeing. But, you know, also how do you see things around you? You can always see differently. The endless curiosity, the feminist circles that I've surrounded myself with, you know, it's become now the larger family of choice. Um, I can call them any moment and they have gone through something similar. So we can quickly abstract what is going on. So sharing stories with my feminist circle has been a huge help uh, in keeping me centered. So I'll call up Gloria Steinem at two at night, right? <laughs> and tell her that Gloria, this is going on and what do I do about it? And from her own experience for over 50, 60 years or whatever, she'll tell me, how about this? How about that? But knowing that I can call her at uh, midnight or two in the morning and I will get a response or, you know, I have such friends, feminist friends, from literally from India to United States to Africa to Europe. And it's like magic, you know, I will That's phone, I'll be in Morocco. Community. Yeah, I'll be in Morocco and, you know, two activists will show up at my hotel and take me around. Amazing. And we'll share stories. I, you know, it's, it's really fun. And I think there are only two movements like this in our world right now. The, fem the women's movement and uh, the environmental movement, which probably have these huge communities around the world. It's so yeah. true. And it's like, you know, we always talk about it when we're doing this work. It's people always say, oh, you know, where do you meet people like that? It's like you meet them volunteering, doing these things. So that's exactly. where you're going to meet the authentic people. How did we people. meet? Yeah. Yeah. How did like, you and I meet? And you feel that common connection where yeah. it's like, we're here for a higher purpose. This and by the way, there's yeah. a lot of good people in yeah. the world doing a lot of good things. And we sometimes yeah. forget that. And, yeah. you know, but I, I think, you know, this topic of, you know, child exploitation is such a difficult one you know if, if if you can think of all the things we face that we you know that people would probably like okay i know what's going on but you know i got my own stuff to deal with um this conversation ha has been really good and i i you know i wish this was a video because if they if they saw you and and the, the strength that you have and the the platform and the love that you give to this problem is really admirable. It's really admirable. You, you know, you, you, when I thought, you know, when Molly said, oh, she was a journalist and she's doing this, I, I immediately, you know, had all my preconceptions about journalists. But then when I, when I did my research on you, the, how you, you immersed yourself in this with your heart and created a systemic way to not only get the message out, but to, to solve. And I really admire that. Thank I really you, Hans, that. and thank you, Molly. You know, the one thing I want to do, because people ask me what next, you know, like I've helped girls, girl by girl, woman by woman, through my NGO, Apne Aap. 
then i thought that's not enough because i have to create system change because, uh, because how much will i be able to do in my lifetime right so then i thought okay law by law because if i create laws then there will be legal frameworks which will lead to welfare systems which will create the ecosystem for uh, more change because if i get all the countries on board so i worked with the un to create the un protocol to end trafficking that was also now 20 years ago and then with different countries went and testified to the us senate for the passage of the trafficking victim protection act here the first law against trafficking in the us and then france and you know south africa and uh, sweden norway iceland country philippines i went all over the world doing the same also in my own country india after changing laws in other countries and um now i've come to the point that we've got the laws 140 countries have signed on to the un protocol and changed their laws to meet the standards of the un protocol uh we have got a model law which we love which we call the nordic model which is that we want to decriminalize uh prostituted women and children because we recognize the absence of choices uh that have put them in this situation but uh, we definitely want to punish the traffickers and we want to penalize the johns which is put them through education programs and make them understand the consequence of the actions find them lighter prison sentences for repeat offenders and so shift the blame from the victim to the perpetrator and therefore allow the victims to come forward for services um So we call it the Nordic model or the equality model. So we the have the laws. The coalition model that you, you yes, the coalition about, yeah. model. So you know we have the laws. We have the individuals I've helped. I know I've contributed in my own lifetime. So I have hope because of that. You know, people say, "Oh, don't you lose hope?" And I sometimes do when a girl I've been helping is pulled into prostitution again. Her father will come and pull her out of a boarding school I run or something. You know. Uh, or she'll be dead from AIDS, or somebody will have murdered a woman in my organization. I faced all of this, right? But uh, the hope is in the change which is happening. I see more survivors in my 25 years than ever before who come forward and speak about what's going on to them. I see better laws in all countries. I see an understanding that uh, prostitution is a form of sex trafficking, and it's based on inequality. Um, I do see that um a paradigm shift because this is really based on the universal declaration of human rights. Uh you know where we began to see that violence against women is a human rights abuse, right? So I've seen all this but now I feel I want the next thing that I want to do is that I want to change in consciousness among men women all of us uh, who are sitting together in circles and circles trying to figure out how to do things better, right? and i want um i imagine a world in which no human being is bought or sold but i also imagine a world in which relationships between the sexes and the genders are based on mutuality where sex is welcome not just consensual you know because consent can be obtained under so many circumstances and imagine if we had sex with each other based on welcome sex you know it would be so much more fun in any case so i want to shine a spotlight on the human face of sex trafficking but through that make us think in our own lives in each human being's life man or woman or transgender or you know there are so many sex uh, sexes and sexualities in between for people to think about like um what kind of sex do i really want what kind of relationship do i want with someone who's not my biological sex or gender right and um we can think about it i think i think we can get there uh, because gender fluidity is already started in our world so i just want more fun out of sex you know rather than domination more participation so true i, I love that about <laughs> about tantra because when i first started working with human trafficking survivors sometimes you see sex as this thing that can destroy a child a woman a, a man a, anyone i mean it can be used as such a weapon of violence but it can also be the thing that leads to self liberation and That's transcendence and exactly. so if we can exp- and really the person who's going to have sex with the child they want transcendence too but you know that's the thing about mu- mutuality is if you think about sex where both sides can have fun rather than yeah. one side yeah. having fun it's it can be different so if i think i'm going to be liberated by the sexual experience uh, but you're not thinking about whether the other side is going to be liberated by the sexual <laughs> experience then it's not that much fun so true 
And that is that is definitely true. Very few, I think, especially as women, oftentimes the statistics on faking orgasms are just like so sad to me because because women just feel like they have to perform to make the man happy. But they, my grandmother didn't yeah. even know what an orgasm was. One yeah. day I was talking to her about my work, and I don't know how we got into this conversation. And she said, "You had so, a discussion with your grandmother about orgasm." Yes, I've never I don't know. That. I don't know how we came to it. And so she said, "Ruchi, what's an orgasm?" So I said, oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I think, so. I think whether it's this topic or, or like you said, what you're trying to get, it's just, uh, we, we all want a better place to live and a better, you know, whether it's climate change or whether it's relationships, you know, we all inherently don't want the bad stuff. No. We want, we want to be better to do better but there's a lot that stands in the way of that preconceptions prejudices choice and i think um, it takes person by person though if yeah. every person if every one of your clients you talk to every one of your every one of our friends something that everybody can do is educate the educate themselves about the realities of trafficking and then share that with others at the work dinner at the at the you know social function just to talk about it even a little bit and you know molly if we can get to the point where we can explain to people that actually you know commodifying any human being comes from the point of view of cutting off empathy in yourself mm-hmm. uh, and you know yes. that's what yes. i want to, uh, my campaign to make people understand really and i call it the last girl campaign uh, because i want them to imagine the last girl and who she is right mm. And, yeah. you know, uh, she is, if you shut your eyes, and I want everyone listening to this podcast to shut their eyes for like 10 seconds and think about the 13-year-old in a brothel. What does she look like to you? She's a girl. She's young. She's poor. She's black in America or of low caste in India. So you can already see the inequality she suffers from. And open your eyes and think that would you like to turn her into a commodity? Of course not. So think about how you can build empathy with her. Mm. Thank you so much, Ruchira. It's just been transformative. For those who have heard these words, I hope they've touched your heart as deeply as they have ours. May Thank we you. all find our ways Thank to you. continue this mission. And we did this in the middle of a hotel lobby. And I will tell you, no matter how the sound comes out, the message is so important. I think our readers will forgive the... Uh, the sound uh, problems and, and hear the amazing message. Thank <laughs> Absolutely. you. Thank you. Thank you, Molly. Thank you, Hans. Our podcast, Conversations Matter, is produced by Amalia Briggs. Our sound engineer is Matthew Tucker. And our amazing sponsor is The Great Courses Plus. Thank you. We couldn't do it without you. <laughs>